All right, well, let's get started. How many of you guys still have a piggy bank or your kids have a piggy bank? Yeah, so a lot of you, it's a big deal. Uh, piggy banks are way cooler now than they were when I was a kid. There are, I saw there's like animal robotic piggy banks that actually take the money and eat it, which is pretty cool. There are ATM machines that count the money for you when you put it in and then keep a balance of how much you've saved. I actually saw one that's a video game. And when you put your money in, you've got to beat the video game to get your money back out. And let's be, that would actually help some of us with our savings if we had to beat it. Especially if it was like one of those new 3D games. Like if it's Donkey Kong or Dig Dug, man, I'm breaking the bank. But when I play the new 3D games with my kids, I might be saving for the rest of my life and that piggy bank would still have my money when I died. But piggy banks are cooler than they used to be. Growing up, I actually had a Darth Vader piggy bank. I'm not sure about the theology of giving all your money to the empire, but it was an awesome piggy bank. You may be wondering where the piggy bank actually comes from, and it goes all the way back to the Middle Ages. There was a clay that was really inexpensive called pig clay, P-Y-G-G clay, and they would make these pots out of that pig clay. And so people started saving you know, money in the, the pig pots, and so a couple hundred years later, somebody thought P-I-G sounds a whole lot like P-Y-G-G, so they made it look like a pig, and ultimately we get the piggy bank. Our kids usually do a pretty good job of saving, and they all have a piggy bank they put it into. I remember when our kids were younger, we used to borrow money from them all the time because they had more money than we did when it was time to do something. But the reality for adults is we don't do nearly as good a job as our kids do in saving. Uh, I read an article from a couple of months ago in the Forbes Advisor online that said that 28% of American adults, so more than one in four uh, American adults don't have $1,000 in total saving. That's between emergency savings account, any sort of uh, retirement accounts, or any other sort of savings. And, and that tells you that we're struggling to save. According to a recent AARP survey, one out of every four people over the age of 50 think that they'll never be able to retire. And 70% on that same study said they were worried that inflation is outrunning their savings, and it concerns them about retirement. But I saw a separate survey from May of this year that shows that 42% of Americans between the ages of 55 and 64 don't even have a retirement account. So what that tells me is the three out of four adults, 50 and over, that think they're going to retire one, at, one day is probably a little too optimistic. We're in the second week of our short three-week uh, sermon series called Money Matters, where we're looking at some wisdom from the Bible about getting control of our finances and honoring God with our money. Remember last week we talked about these buckets. I know you've slept since then, but we talked about these three buckets and how simple our finances really are. We talked about that we have income, and for most of us, that's a paycheck. Some of you may have another source of income, but for most of us, all of our income is from a paycheck. And so we take that income... And then we use it in one of these three buckets. And pretty much all of our income goes in one of these three buckets. So last week we talked about this spend bucket and how to get control of your spending so that you can start to think about these next two buckets because you're not spending so much. This week we're going to focus in on this save buckets and we're going to talk about the theology of saving. We're going to talk about some ideas about the proper motives and reasons to save. And then we're going to talk about some practical strategies for how to get started, or if you're already saving, how you can do even better with your savings. But the reality is, all of our money goes in one of these three buckets, and we said that most of our money goes in this spend bucket, right, because we're paying for a house payment or rent, we're paying for insurance, groceries, school supplies, kids' activities, eating out, all these different things that we have to pay for, clothes. And then if we have a little money left, maybe we save a little. And if we have a little left after we save a little and spend a lot, maybe we give a little bit away. And that's kind of how we're living out life. And so we really want to talk about how to think about these buckets differently so that you can take a different level of control over your finances, get it in order, but you can also honor God. So in honoring God, last week we talked about this important Bible truth that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. 
Now, a lot of us think that giving, particularly giving back to God, is a spiritual decision, but a lot of us don't think about eating out as a spiritual decision or giving to our 401k at work and saving up for retirement. But those things are spiritual decisions, and here's why. All of your money actually belongs to God. Your money is not really your money at all. We talked about some scripture last week that makes this very clear. And so at first glance, you're like, whoa, 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 Uh, it's my money. It's, It's really not. If you're a follower of Jesus, and even if you're not, it belongs to God. But here's how this idea and this understanding can transform the way you think about your finances and actually help you get better control over your money. Because if you understand that it doesn't really belong to you, and instead it belongs to God, you're going to handle that money a little different way. Think about how many of you guys have a company credit card or some ability to spend either the company money or a client money in some forms or passion? Yeah, several of you do. Do you think about the money for your clients or your company differently than the way you spend your own money? Of course you do, because you're accountable for how you use that money. In other words, if you go out and buy video games on the company credit card, you're going to get fired and you might actually go to jail. And so because it's someone else's money, you're more cautious in the way that you use it. And if you can think about your money as not being your money, but being God's money, then you'll have that same level of caution and thoughtfulness about the way you use these three buckets. And that will help us honor God with our savings and our giving, but it'll also help us get control and find that we have more money. So we need to understand that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. Listen how, listen to how Jesus says this in Luke 16, 11 through 13. He says, so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus is being pretty tough here, and he's being very direct with us about the connection between money and our relationship with him. He is saying it's, you're using someone else's money, and if you don't use that wisely, you're not going to have the relationship you want. And he even puts it in terms of spiritual blessings from God. And we talked about that a little last week. In other words, Jesus is saying money matters. So if every financial decision is a spiritual decision, then we look at, need to look at what the Bible has to say about these three buckets so that we can understand what God's plan for us is on that. And today we're going to talk about this save bucket. And to get started, Christians have very different ideas about savings. Some Christians believe you really shouldn't save that much at all, that you should really pretty much take all of your excess and put it in the give bucket because you have to trust God with taking care of you in the future. Listen, this is a passage of scripture that some of those people would rely on. This is Matthew 6, 25 through 34. It's Jesus saying this, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Let's see, that's the reaction I get with money sermons all the time. I think that might have been an adult in the back. Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is just thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink and what shall we wear? For the pagans chase after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So some Christians would look at passages of Scripture like that, and they would say, look, the birds don't save up. The the grass doesn't worry about what it's going to buy or need in the future. So we really shouldn't think much about that save bucket. We should think more about the give bucket. But then there are other passages of Scripture that make it pretty clear that we're supposed to save, and other Christians rely on that. Listen to these. This is Proverbs uh, 6, 6 through 8. Go to the ant. In other words, look at the ant. 
You sluggard, pretty direct here. You're lazy, look at what the ant does. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions, it saves in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Then look at Proverbs 13, 22. A good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Clearly indicating that we're supposed to save, not just for ourselves, but to save even for future generations to make life easier on them. So you've got passages of scripture that some people would say, tell us maybe not to save. And then we've got some other passages of scripture that make it clear that we're supposed to save. And, And at first glance, these scriptures kind of seem to say different things. And, and so the question is, should we save or should we trust God with our future? And, and the answer is yes. Yes, we should save. And yes, we should put our absolute faith and trust in God to take care of us. So how do we find balance between making sure that we are saving the way we're supposed to save, but we're also trusting God and giving the way we should? And and the reality is in the Old Testament, it was pretty easy because the Old Testament had something called the tithe. The tithe was 10% of everything that you made went into the give bucket and you gave it back to God. And then everything else went into the spend and, and save buckets. But in the New Testament, the idea of the tithe pretty much goes away. You just don't see it discussed. But it's not because the New Testament doesn't talk about money. In fact, it talks about money a lot. Did you know that Jesus talks about wealth and money more than he talks about faith? That's a pretty big deal. He talks more about money than prayer. He talks more about money than he does heaven and hell combined. So there's all of this talk about money. But Jesus doesn't say which of these three buckets things should go in. He doesn't give us any indication on that. And let's be honest, it'd probably be a little easier if Jesus would just say, look, put 80% of your money in the spend bucket, 10% in the save bucket, and 10% in the give bucket. And I've actually heard some preachers and teachers use that, what they call the 80-10-10 rule. And it sounds good at first glance, and it's pretty simple to understand. But I think when you understand what God says about what he wants from us, that doesn't really make sense. It's not consistent with what Jesus is asking for. Because it's really not about your money. Jesus wants our heart. And so he wants us to wrestle and pray and think about what to do with our money, whether it goes in this bucket or this bucket or that bucket. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19 through 21. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's what Jesus is after. Jesus is after our heart. He wants every little bit of us. If you think that Jesus wants your money, you misunderstand his purpose. If you think Jesus is even like impressed at all by your wealth, you you don't understand what Jesus is looking for. It's all God's anyway. And if God wants your money, man, he's going to take it from you. He'll just run over you like a train over a tin can. Nothing left but a little greasy smudge on the road. But that's not what he's interested in. He's got no interest in your money for money's sake. He wants every single part of you. He wants what you do on Saturday night, what you do on Monday, what you do at work. He wants how you think about your family, how you think about your job, how you spend your time. He wants every single part of us. He wants our loyalty, our devotion, our love, and our trust. He wants us to think about him, prioritize him. Ultimately, what he wants is our heart. Several years ago, after church, a young father came in with his probably eight-year-old daughter in tow, and the daughter climbed up in a chair, and she sat down with a video game and started playing on an iPad or something, and and the dad came over, and he talked really quietly to me, and he said, so I want to know how much I should spend on my daughter's Christmas presents. He said, I have a great job. I don't have any debt, so money is not an issue, so I want to give her good gifts, but at the same time, I don't want to spoil her. And so he's trying to figure out that balance. He said, does does the Bible have anything to say about how much you should spend on gifts or what percentage of your income or anything like that? And I said, it really doesn't. There's no specific numbers in the Bible. There's no specific percentages. But I said, here's what she needs to understand. As you give her good gifts, you need to teach her generosity. 
So you need to involve her in giving gifts to other people for Christmas. Help her, you know, take her shopping with you when you buy those gifts. But also, maybe put together some blessing bags for homeless people at Christmas time. Help her, get her to help you put those together and then take those with you to pass out. Help her to understand that generosity is important. To understand that she is very blessed and make sure she understands this idea of generosity because that's what's most important. And what I understand this guy, this guy was doing was he was trying to look out for the best for his daughter. He loved his daughter, and he wanted to figure out what is the right balance between spoiling her and giving her good gifts. And in that moment, I realized the very similar struggle that God wants us to go through as we consider these three buckets. He wants us to really wrestle with what do we do with our money? Where does it go? He, he wants us to understand that he's a part of every decision we make and that we put him first in that. And look, the reality is for some of you, you're called to give the, the tithe, the 10%. Others of you, you may be called to give more because God is calling you to something for your heart and it takes you giving up something to understand that he's first. He wants you to put him first, not the world first, not stuff first. In other words, every financial decision is a spiritual decision. So we need to think through and pray through and ask God's wisdom for how we spend, how we save, and how we give. And as we think this week specifically about saving, whether you're saving in a way that honors God is really less about percentage or amount, and it's more about your heart. What's your motivation to save? And I'm gonna start by giving you a couple of bad motivations, sinful motivations to save. The first bad or wrong motivation to save is greed. The Bible is very clear that greed is a wrong motive. Jesus says this in Luke 12, 15. He says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Then the apostle Paul says this in 1 Timothy 6, 25. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or, oh, Oh, I just jumped, sorry. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So it's clear here, greed is a wrong motive to save. If you're saving because you love money, that's wrong. And let's be honest, as a society, we love money. I looked it up and there's actually over 80 different slang words for money. And sociologists would tell you that there's a connection between how many slang words we have for something and how much society values it. And we see, so think about some other things that society values and think about all the different slang words there are for those things. Now, compare that to what I think is a very important thing, the belt. The belt has a very important job to hold our pants up. And if my belt fails, that's bad. You're going to need therapy. It's got a very important job. And yet, I can't think of a single slang word for the belt because we just don't value the poor belt. And yet, there's 80 different slang words for money. That's greed. So how do we avoid saving out of greed? Generosity, that's how we do it. As we put money in this save bucket, we also need to think about putting money back to God in this give bucket. Because if greed is a poison, then generosity is the antidote. It's what cures that. And next week, Chris is going to talk about how giving and being generous can actually transform the way we think about our money and help us actually do better with each of these three buckets because we have a healthy attitude. So greed is a wrong motive. Here's another wrong motive, fear or worry. We shouldn't save out of fear or worry. I want us to look back at Matthew chapter 6 again, this scripture that we looked at before, and I want you to look at the focus of this scripture when Jesus is talking. He says, therefore I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And look down at the last verse, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This passage of Scripture has nothing to do with saving. It's about the sin of worry. God is saying to to save but to also not worry. And God's very serious about that. Do you know that the Bible says over 200 times, fear not or do not worry? As much as we like to think that our money protects us, it just doesn't. It doesn't protect us 
from disaster. I want to think about Hurricane Helene. Hurricane Helene has devastated thousands of families in Florida, in Georgia, in North Carolina, in Tennessee. Thousands of families have no house. Everything that they've saved up is gone now, trying to restore. We can still remember Hurricane Harvey here in Katy, how we know families that had saved money, that every bit of that savings went back into trying to hit, get their house back in order. They even had to borrow money again, even though they had their house paid off, try to restore it. And I read that over 200 people have been confirmed dead in Hurricane Helene. And I understand that there's hundreds more still missing. No matter how much they saved, no matter how prepared they were, money didn't change anything. And I understand that there's another hurricane that this week is supposed to hit Florida. And, and those people at this point, they're not worried about money. They're worried about life and protecting what they already have. Money isn't where our hope is. And so if we're saving out of worry and fear, that's wrong. Listen to what King Solomon says about this in Proverbs uh, 18, 10 through 11. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. And I love this. They imagine it as a wall too high to scale. People with money can start to think that somehow the money protects them from disaster or danger, that somehow a retirement account or an investment portfolio is where they put their hope because it's a shelter. And so we begin to run to our wealth rather than run to God. But what we understand is that wall that we build with our wealth will not sustain disaster. When cancer strikes or some serious disease, we're not going to care how much we've saved because that won't be the important thing. Don't put your hope in the wrong place. Don't put your hope and your trust in money. Put it in Jesus. So if we're saving out of greed or we're saving out of fear or worry, those are wrong motives to save. So here's the, the proper motive that should cause wise Christians to save money. Preparation. It's right and good for Christians to prepare for the future. Don't worry about the future. Trust in God with your future, but you need to prepare for it. Listen to what Solomon says about this in Proverbs 21, 20. He says, the wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. In other words, wise people save up stuff for when they're going to need it. Fools don't. They, they use everything as they go. And the reality is this. You are going to have unexpected expenses at some point. And you've got to prepare for that. You've got to save for that because that will make that bump in the road a little easier. You can also save to help your kids get through college so that they have less debt when they come out of college. And one of these days, you're going to want to retire and slow down. And if you begin to save, you'll be able to do that and not be a burden on your children. And even this last bucket of giving is made way easier when you've got savings. Because when you're living paycheck to paycheck, it's really hard to be generous with God and with others. And so that's a right reason to prepare for the future. All right, so we've talked about the theology of giving. We've talked about the proper motives for giving, but let's talk about some practical principles for saving. The first principle is this, save for the unexpected. <laughs> this life doesn't always go the way you plan. The car breaks down at just the worst time. The AC on the house goes out in July. You lose your job, you get sick and miss work, you get injured and miss work, and suddenly you've got some expenses that you weren't prepared for. And if you begin to save for the unexpected, that's going to make those bumps a little easier. So the first thing you need to do is to have an emergency savings account and begin saving for that. Remember we talked last week about paying off credit cards? This is even more important than paying off credit cards. And the reality is an emergency savings account actually becomes more important if you've maxed out your credit cards. Because if you have an unexpected expense, you may not be able to borrow to handle that, and so you need some savings set aside to handle that expense. Most financial experts say that you should have at least three months of living expenses saved up in an emergency savings account. Now, here's what's depressing. Some financial experts are starting to say now that you should have six or nine months saved up in an emergency savings account. And look, don't keep that money in your regular uh, checking account because it's too easy at that point to, to make an, boy, I've got some money there and buy something. 
It also just tends to disappear like we talked about last week. You're paying bills and suddenly it's gone. So take it out of that regular checking account and put it in a separate savings account or even better, some sort of money market account. Now, here's the exciting thing about interest rates. We all are frustrated and stressed about how much interest is to buy a house or a car right now. But the flip side of that is there are some money market accounts that are paying between 45 and 5% interest. So if you take the money out of your checking account and you put it into a money market account, hopefully you don't have any emergency expenses for a little while and your money will, will bring profit while it sits in the bank. <clears throat> hopefully you'll have that even left after you have those expenses. All right, here's our next financial principle. Decide whether to save or to eliminate debt. Now, if you have credit card debt, this is easy. Once you get your emergency savings account, then you need to start paying off credit card debt because we talked about this last week. The average credit card interest rate is about 25% or just under right now. You cannot make that much interest in anything unless I guess you buy a lottery ticket and actually win, which is not a good investment strategy. Don't do that. But if you've got credit cards, so emergency savings is first, then credit card. But if you're not in credit card trouble and you've got some lower interest debts, like maybe a car loan or a school loan or a house loan, you, you may have to do a little math to figure out, are you better off paying the minimal amount on your debt and starting to save for the future, or are you better off paying debt? To, to do this, it is math. And I'm sorry, I hate to do it. You math majors are going to love this. Everybody else is going to hate it. But you've got to figure out how much your debt is costing you. And so most of us have no idea how much our debt costs, but some simple math can change that. So here's what you do. Make a list of all your loans, your car loan, your school loan, your house loan. Find out what the balance is, but you also need to find out what the interest rate is on that loan. Some of you probably have no idea what the interest rate is on some of your loans. Well, it's worth pulling out. You need to know the hidden cost of debt. So pull those balance sheets out, look at that interest rate, and then you take your uh, the amount of your loan and put your interest rate next to it. Here's where the math comes in. We're going to do a really simple example with a car loan. So look at this. Let's say your car loan is $20,000 and the interest rate on that car loan is 10%. Here's how the math works to find out how much that debt is costing you each year. 20,000 times 0.1 equals 2,000. Now some of you can just put in the 10 and then hit percent on your uh, calculator, but it's 20,000 times 0.1 equals 2,000. So therefore, the annual cost of that debt on your car is $2,000. Actually, it's a little higher than that because of compounding interest, but we won't get that detailed. So you've, now you know how much your car debt costs you every year, and you can do that with each of your loans. And then once you know that, now you've got to answer the next question. How much could your savings earn you? And so you're going to compare those two things. And this is especially helpful if you get a big chunk of money, like an IRS tax return or somebody leaves you some money or you get an unexpected bonus at work. You need to figure out, do I want to pay off debt or do I want to start to build savings for the future? And, and so you need to think through how much would that money earn me in an investment. Now, if you just put it in your checking account or a savings account at the bank and it's earning one or one and a half percent, it is probably not going to make you enough money to not pay off debt. Although if you have some 0% loan still, if you happen to buy a car a number of years ago and it was 0% or some other purchase, it's more than that. But now, like we talked about a second ago, you can put it in a, uh, some sort of money market account and make almost 5% in that. You can also do a conservative stock market investment, put it maybe in a Fortune 500 index fund, which is fairly safe. And you can earn 7 even 8% generally over the course of two or three years. And, and so I'd encourage you to talk to somebody about how much that money can make you if you invest it. And then once you know how much debt is costing you and how much you can make, then you decide which is the better play. In other words, which is going to help you get a, your control of your finances better. All right, then here's the next principle for saving. Save early, save often. Money saved the right way, a little at a time, will grow significantly over time. But get-rich schemes, <laughs> they generally never work. Listen to how Solomon says this in Proverbs 13, 11. Dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. I think this is such a good principle for making sure that you're investing in a retirement account if your work does that. 
Save a little by little, check by check, and it will grow. But get-rich schemes generally do not work. About 20 years ago, my brother-in-law, who will remain nameless, Jimmy Jackson, I'll give you his address later if you want to write him letters, he convinced me to invest in this penny stock called CMKM. And it was a company that supposedly had thousands of acres of mineral rights in Canada. And they had discovered undisclosed countless value of diamonds. And they just needed a little of my help to get those precious diamonds out of the ground. And we were told that this investment would, would be 10 times in value within just a few months. Yeah, it turns out it was all a scheme. It was a fraud. They were sued by the SEC. Eventually, the owners of that company were indicted and prosecuted, and I was out $2,000. And I had to struggle with forgiveness of my brother-in-law. Sometimes when I tell these stories, I still struggle a little bit with that even today. Get-rich schemes are not the way to save. Can, can we be real with one another for a minute? The Texas lottery is not a retirement strategy. I know I just blew some of your retirement plans up. Scratch-off tickets, not savings plans. Commemorative plates and action figures, that is not an investment portfolio. Save the right way, little by little, and start to save early. The earlier you save, the more money you're going to make over time because of all the compounding interest you're going to get over the years. Let me give you an example for the, the young people that are here in the room. If you're 25 years old and you start every year to save $5,000, just $5,000 in some company account or just in your account, by age 50, you'll have saved $280,000, including interest. By 65, when you're ready to retire, you'll have saved $740,000. And that's just putting $5,000 a year. Obviously, the more you put in that account and the earlier you do it, the more it's going to make. One great way to make sure you save is with automatic savings. And a lot of employers will do that where they'll take an amount out of your check, every pay put check, and put it in some sort of a retirement account, whether that's a 401k or something else. Here's what you need to understand. First of all, that's pre-tax money. So it's not costing you as much as it looks like because you're not paying tax on that right now. And if you've got a company that will take money out and then match some portion of it in a 401k up to a certain percentage of your income, if you don't save at least enough money to get that match, you're leaving free money on the table that your employer is just offering to give you. And if you'll do that with automatic savings, it makes it a whole lot easier. And if your employer doesn't do that, a lot of banks will do that. They'll take, just like you pay for your bills automatically, they'll take a certain amount of money out of your account at the end of each month and move it over into a savings account so that it happens automatically. The key to all of this is have a plan. I read that people that have a savings plan are twice as likely to be successful in their savings as those that just kind of haphazardly do it. Your plan, it shouldn't just have long-term goals, how much you want to save by, you know, 20 years down the road. It should have savings for right now, short-term plans, whether that's maybe saving $25 a month or $20 a week, whatever that looks like, put a plan together. Last week, we talked about having a budget ready for 2025. Make sure that your savings plan goes into that budget and you're planning for savings as well as your expenses. Here's the last important principle that we're going to talk about. Cut and save. It is really hard to save money if you don't find some expense to get rid of. Look at what Solomon says in Proverbs 21, 17. He says, whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. In other words, if all your money is just going out to make yourself happy, you're never going to acquire any money. You're never going to save. And so here's, I'm going to give you just a few little tricks for those of you that refuse to use a budget. One is an almost budget technique, but it, it doesn't require you to sit down and make one. So take the money that you're going to use for different categories of discretionary spending, like eating out or haircuts or, uh, you know, Starbucks, coffees, whatever it might be. And when you get your paycheck, plan for how much you're going to spend and get cash and put that in an envelope that's marked by that different uh, expense. And then when that money is gone out of that envelope, you're done until you get paid again. And make sure that you are putting aside some money and putting it in the bank for savings along the way. Here's a couple of other saving tips for you that don't use a budget. Match your discretionary spending with savings. In other words, if you go spend seven bucks on a you know, triple vente half sweet non-fat caramel macchiato at Starbucks, 
At the same time you do that, put $7 aside in savings. If you get your nails done, put seven, you know, the amount of money and match that spending, go to the movies, match that in savings. This lets you splurge a little on yourself, but also save along the way. And some of you are thinking, well, I can't afford to buy the $7 Starbucks and save $7. What that actually tells you is you really can't afford the $7 Starbucks. Another trick for saving if you're getting started is save up loose change. Just take the little extra that you've got in your pocket and start putting it in a bucket in a piggy bank and find out that over time you'll get some decent savings if you'll leave it alone. My kids, they had pretty significant savings in those piggy banks. Now, some of you are going, Nathan, you're living in the last century. We don't even use money anymore. We use debit cards. A lot of credit, uh, debit card companies and banks will now round up every purchase you make to the next dollar. And they'll take that change and they'll put it over in some sort of savings account for you so you can still do that. Another way to jumpstart your savings is anytime you get a lump sum of money, whether that's an income tax return or if some relative leaves you some money or you get an unexpected bonus, make sure you don't put it all in this bucket. Make sure you put some in the save bucket as well. Look, there's no magic to saving. That, that's not how this works. The key is put a plan together and stick with it. Remember our overriding things that can transform these three buckets. Every financial decision is a spiritual decision. And then our specific strategies for these, this bucket of saving is save for the unexpected, decide whether to save or eliminate debt, save early, save often, and finally, cut and save. If you can really live this out, if you can live out this principle that your money belongs to God and you have to be careful with the way you use it, you're going to find that you're going to get control of your finances. You're going to honor God where right now it feels like money is in control of you. Let's pray.